is that Professor King was part of the actual Nuremberg prosecutorial term of team from the United States. And so he has an incredibly rich uh, vision of Nuremberg and its policy consequences. And without further ado, I introduce you to Professor King. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Unanticipated death on April 12, 1945. 
The very next day, April 13, 1945, Justice Robert H. Jackson, the United States Supreme Court gave a speech before the annual meeting of the American Society of International Law, in which he advocated a trial, a fair trial. In his address, Jackson indicated that he wanted no part of a show trial designed only to convict. Convictions, Jackson said, should be based solely on fully supported evidence. If the evidence was not there to support a conviction, the individual should be acquitted. Jackson's observations on a prospective trial of the Nazi war criminals were acknowledged by the White House on May 2, 1945, when President Truman appointed him as his plenipotentiary in planning with the Allies for the trial of the Nazi war criminals. On June 6, 1945, Jackson reported back to the President, outlining his plans for the substantive aspects of the trial. In his report, Jackson outlined the charges he felt should be the basis for the trial. The first crime, the most important, was aggressive war, which was styled as crimes against peace. Jackson felt that this was a fundamental crime and consisted of planning, preparation, waging of wars of aggression, and wars in violation of international treaties. The second charge recommended by Jackson was war crimes. These were crimes against civilians and prisoners of war in violation of the laws of war. The charges were based on the Hague Convention of 1899 and 1907, Geneva Convention 1928, made the conduct of warfare. And most nations of the world have adhered to these two conventions, these two sets of conventions. The church, third charge, crimes against humanity, which dealt with multiple types of assault on civilians, including particular murder, persecution of individuals on racial, religious, and national origin grounds. This was indeed a sweeping charge which is designed to reach all assaults on civilians not covered by the War Crimes Count. Hitler, was, Hitler, the Nazi leader, was once asked by his generals what the world would think if they killed every man, woman, and child in Poland. His response was, quote, who remembers the Armenians, end of quote referring to the Turkish army's genocide of 1.5 million Armenians beginning in 1915. Crimes against humanity charge gave notice that the world would no longer turn a blind eye to crimes against civilians just because they are committed by a sovereign state. Jackson also advocated the conspiracy charge to reach those who conspired to commit the foregoing crimes. He recognized that these atrocities did not happen in a vacuum. Those most responsible often did not get their hands dirty, but that should not prevent their being held accountable. By addressing the treaties and customary international law the Nazis violated, Jackson preempted the defense that Nuremberg was applying ex post facto law. <laughs> this accomplished two things. It helped codify existing international law, laying the groundwork for modern prosecution in the ad hoc tribunals and the International Criminal Court. But more important to those at, of us at Nuremberg, it reinforces Jackson's vision of a fair trial, not victor's justice. In his report to President Truman, Jackson also advocated the elimination of two prospective defenses by the Nazi war criminals. These were sovereign immunity and superior order. Jackson felt that these, if these two defenses were allowed in combination, <coughs> then no one could be convicted at the prospective trials because no one could be held responsible. As regarded the sovereign immunity defense, Jackson thought that there should be the fullest responsibility where authority was the highest. No longer, he felt, 
to those who exercise authority in the name of, na of the nation escape responsibility for their deeds. He recommended that they be called to full account. The second defense, which Jackson wanted to eliminate, was superior orders. He felt that the Nazi leaders who would be subject to trial should not be able to hide behind the defense that they're obeying their superiors to justify their to justify their criminal acts. He felt that those who committed criminal acts should be called to account and punished for their actions. He exercised <coughs> great foresight by eliminating this defense. Because in Nazi Germany, an absolute dictatorship, most important orders were issued by in Hitler's name. However, Hitler was nowhere to be found, having, as we later determined, committed suicide in his Berlin bunker on April 30th, 1945. The Allies met in London in the early summer of 1945 to discuss Jackson's draft of a proposed procedure for the trial. The British and French did not request some substantive changes in Jackson's draft, although the French disliked the conspiracy charge because they felt that cons the conspiracy, to the extent it existed, merged with the substantive crime itself. But the USSR was a different story. Their representatives argued that the aggressive war count should apply only to the Nazis' actions. The Russians wanted no generic approach to this count because they felt it could be extended to cover some of their own activities. Jackson, to a considerable extent, held a line on this one. The compromise reached in the London Agreement and the Nuremberg Charter called only for the prosecution of the Axis powers war criminals, but the definitions were stated in generic terms so as to be universally applicable in the future. Another issue which was debated in London was the presumption of guilt or innocence. Soviet representatives wanted a presumption of guilt with regard to the defendant. But Jackson wanted a presumption of innocence. By insisting on a presumption of innocence, the burden fell on the prosecutor to prove the defendant's guilt and gave each defendant the benefit of the doubt, elements that are now widely considered essential for fair trial. Here again, Jackson prevailed, and his foresight on this issue gave much increased credibility to the results of the trials. The next issue faced was the locale of the trial. The USSR representatives wanted the trial to be held in Berlin. Jackson dissented and argued for Nuremberg, which had the largest undamaged courthouse in Germany. Moreover, Nuremberg was of great symbolic significance uh, it was the site of the Nazi Party headquarters <coughs> and of the huge Nazi Party rallies where Hitler, Hitler held forth and his challenges to the world. Nuremberg symbolized Nazism at its zenith, and that is important to correct the record as to the true implications of Nazism, which were indeed criminal. The next issue is the selection of the prospective defendants. Most of the defendants were in U.S. custody. On this issue, Jackson felt that for precedental reasons, this, they should be the leaders of each walk of German life, whether they be military, or diplomatic, police, or industrialists. Here, Jackson again prevailed, and it was he, working with the other allies, who targeted the individuals to be tried at Nuremberg. Joachim von Ribbentrop, the Nazi Minister of Foreign Affairs, was found guilty on all four counts. Reichsmarschall Hermann Gehring, commander of the Luftwaffe, German Air Force, guilty on all four counts. <coughs> Gustav Krupp von Boland and Halbach, chairman of the Association of German Industrials and major arms manufacturer using slave labor from occupied countries and concentration camp indicted on all four counts. He was not tried because he had a stroke, but uh, his indictment stands as part of history. Julius Stryker, the publisher, who used his newspaper and children's book 
to incite anti Semitism, convicted of crimes against humanity. In the matter of the defense counsel, Jackson took the view that the defendant should be well represented. He arranged the Allied Control Council to assume the cost of defense counsel, and also for such counsel to be largely of the defendant's own choosing. The, the, <laughs> the outcome of these negotiations was the Lumber, London Charter of August 8, 1945, which provided the basis for the trials. One further point is important with regard to the presentation against the defendants at Nuremberg. Jackson felt that as far as the U.S. prosecution was concerned, the evidence against the Nazis should be largely documentary from the Germans' own files. He felt that this, through this approach, the Nazis would convict themselves and that the result would have greater long-term credibility. Nuremberg officially began on November 20th, 1945. The real opening then was on November 21st, 1945. And Justice Jackson delivered the opening statement for the United States of America. In that statement, he set forth what Nuremberg was all about. Some high points are worthy of particular note. I should like to share them with you to here today. First, Jackson stated that, quote, the complaining party at the bar here today is civilization. <coughs> By this he meant that this trial was to make a break to the barbarism of the past. Barbarism on so great a scale that it cost over 50 million lives in World War II and reached new limits of degradation never before experienced in history. Second, Jackson stated that the trial was, quote, one of the most important, significant tributes ever paid by power to reason. By this he meant that reason was now to be the order of the day, and the guilt of the defendants would be determined through the use of reason in a fair trial. Summary execution of the defendants by the Allied Party powers based on their military dominance was not to be permitted. The force of law was indeed to replace the law of force. Third, Jackson stated that, quote, as we pass a poison chalice to the lips of these defendants, we pass it to our lips as well. This meant that the trial was to represent equity and that the allies themselves who brought the charges against the Nazi defendant were to be governed in their future behavior by the standards established at Nuremberg. Jackson felt that if Nuremberg was to have lasting meaning, the principles of Nuremberg should encompass benchmarks for the behavior of all people in the world, then and in the future, that indeed they should have universal application in the interest of fairness and equity. In sum, what Jackson wished to convey through the opening statement was that Nuremberg was to mark a beginning of a new era in human history. After all, he was indeed the architect of Nuremberg, and this was his vision, which is as valid today as it was 60 years ago. Jackson's foresight in focusing on documents and the Nazis' own files of proof of their guilt bore fruit in the judgment of the tribunal. In commenting on this, the International Military Tribunal said in effect that the Nazis had convicted themselves with the evidence submitted. The judgment was equitable and that three defendants were acquitted because the evidence was not there to support their conviction. The fear people had had before the trial had not been realized. Granting the defendants a fair trial right to publicly defend their action had not resulted in destabilizing the Allies' occupation and rebuilding efforts. Herman Goering is widely seen as having gotten the better of Jackson during the cross-examination. And yet he was still convicted, condemned not by clever words, but by the weight of evidence. I came home from Nuremberg filled with the spirit of Nuremberg. But the public was not enthusiastic, and the bar turned its back on 
recognition of Nuremberg for what it was. A complete break for the past. Despite having done well at Yale Law School, then there's now a top ranking law school. I had trouble getting a job when I returned. This was in part because of Senator Robert Taft of Ohio and others who excoriated Nuremberg. In addition, the Cold War had intervened and the U.S. and USSR were engaged in a deep conflict on the issues of the day. With the ending of the Cold War in the late 1980s, Nuremberg passed to a considerable extent achieved recognition, achieved the recognition that is always deserved. The Nuremberg Principles are being followed in UN sponsored and other tribunals. And an international court has been established which has been charged with the enforcement of what was substantively established at Nuremberg. A number of areas of the world, a new regime of international human rights is the order of the day. Much progress has been made, but the United States, which through Jackson created Nuremberg, is fighting a rear guard of action against the advances of the Nuremberg Principle. Jackson's position, Jackson position that the Nuremberg Principle should be applied in judging the conduct of all nations and their leaders is being disregarded by the United States today. The U.S. has turned its back on the International Criminal Court which would institutionalize Nuremberg. And the U.S. has disregarded the Geneva Conventions of 1949, governing the treatment of prisoners of war taken in course of hostility by holding them without trial and subject them to torture. Progress is using our resources to create a better, more just world, not manipulating language and digging for loopholes, to lower the minimum standards of decency. The fears the world faces today are not new. Even courageous people, such as Winston Churchill, feared that providing Nazi leaders a, a far, fair and public trial would undermine the fragile security brought about them by the Allied victory. Nuremberg faced these fears and proved that the rule of law is not such a fragile thing that it strengthens democracies even when applied to those who would deny it to others. What is needed now is a revival of the spirit of Nuremberg, a better and more peaceful world based on justice is within our grasp. The major powers of peace no longer stage the brink of war. We have a golden opportunity to build a more secure future for generations to come. This was, in effect, our goal at Nuremberg, and we gauged a considerable self-sacrifice in our attempt to achieve it. I hope that there will be those among the current generation who will take it upon themselves to follow in our footsteps. So, let idealism and vision be order, the order of the day. Let us use conferences such as this as a means to rekindle with enthusiasm, rekindle the enthusiasm which brought about Nuremberg. We can indeed achieve a better world if we are willing to make it our future. Thank you.